From time to time, when we pause to realign ourselves with our surroundings, we may wonder about the heritage of our community and the lives of those who preceded us. As we discover the common bonds that connected the different inhabitants of our scenic valley and mesas, we can see how this history has influenced our present day existence. When I experience the vistas, cool breezes, and visceral ambiance surrounding the mission, it is easy to imagine why my native ancestors, Bayom Kawichum, or People of the West, would have chosen this valley site to inhabit. As descendants of the Shoshone, we lived in dwellings made from reeds and grasses located in small tribal villages and settlements for centuries. As stewards, we managed wildland resources to meet our need for food, clothing, and shelter. Primarily as hunters and gatherers, we applied learned techniques to stay in harmony with nature. Today we also employ the methods available to us to attain food, clothing, and provide shelter. As a culture, we soared through the prospects of our daily lives working to improve our condition and that of others in our modern village. As a collective community, we incorporate as many ways as possible to conserve and sustain our way of life. Things are not so dissimilar. The California mission system began in 1769 with the arrival of Friar Junipero Serra to Alta California. The missions were established in order to claim the land for Spain. Governed by the Viceroy of New Spain, the convergence of the two cultures was placed in the hands of the Franciscan Fathers who came up from Mexico to convert the Indians to Catholicism and to teach them new skills in hopes that they would become productive citizens of the Crown. After the intervention of the Spanish and the establishment of San Luis Rey, the local inhabitants were absorbed into the master plan of the Spanish Empire. First known as San Luiseños by association with the mission, but later changed to Luiseños, they inhabited the valley for thousands of years prior to the founding of San Luis Rey. Their descendants are still active members of many area communities. Mission San Luis Rey de Francia was founded on June 13, 1798, the feast day of Saint Anthony of Padua, by Father Fermín Francisco de la Suen, successor to Junipero Serra. The mission is named after Saint Louis IX, King of France, and patron of the secular Franciscan order by Marquez de Brancefort, Viceroy of New Spain. Father Antonio Peiri was put in charge as an administrator and guardian until his departure in 1832. Father Peiri administered to the spiritual needs of the Native Americans and, under his guidance, their hard work and ability to adapt to new trades and skills, developed San Luis Rey into what is known today as the King of the Missions. Tucked away in a scenic valley just a few miles from the Pacific coast lies the majestic jewel of early California history called Mission San Luis Rey de Francia. The 18th in a chain of 21 Alta California missions that stretched from San Diego to Sonoma along the El Camino Real or the King's Highway. It was strategically located in a fertile valley midway between San Diego de Alcalá and San Juan Capistrano missions. Known for its size, population, and productivity and sphere of influence, the property once extended many miles to the north and south and east to the foothills of Palomar Mountain. More marriages and baptisms were performed at San Luis Rey than any other mission. Domesticated livestock reached a level of nearly 60,000 head as a grain production peaked at 67,000 bushels. A massive construction program took place as buildings went up rather quickly, which made this mission the largest structure in all of Alta California until 1850. The walls formed a massive quadrangle that was constructed of adobe, fire clay bricks, and wooden timbers. The quadrangle also served as a viewing area for the entertainment on festival days.
Strolling around the arched colonnade or through the sunken gardens, it is easy to imagine the everyday life of the friars and Indians who inhabited the mission two centuries ago. For 33 years, under the guardianship of Father Peri, the mission thrived, eventually housing and serving the largest Indian population, nearly 3,000, of any other mission. Outside the mission quadrangle were many gardens. One of the most unique was located to the south of the property, known as the Lavanderia and Sunken Garden. This area was a hub of social life at the mission. It had a series of pools and fountains which supplied fresh water for washing clothes and bathing. The garden was surrounded by an adobe wall and had an arched gateway and tiled stairway leading down to the water basins. Peaches, pears, melons, apples and date plums were a few of the items that grew in this massive garden. Adjacent to the lavanderia was an industrial area with a massive kiln used in the making of fire clay brick and tiles and another smaller kiln for pottery along with a pair of tanning vats for the processing of hides. During the Spanish and Mexican period, great herds of mission cattle grazed the expansive mission lands. New settlers to the area coveted the property of the mission. For the Franciscan friars, the teaching of the Catholic faith was the primary goal. The church was the cornerstone of the mission quadrangle. Once inside this church, one is caught up into the inspiring world of holy devotion and religious art. The images still speak to us, even across the centuries. It contained works of art that were used as teaching guides and symbols of faith. Mass was held daily, and everyone was called to services by the ringing of the bells. Completed in 1815, the church is bold, late Baroque and neoclassical with Moorish influences. The designs emulate those which may have been found in the cathedrals of Spain. The main altar, Rededos, contained statues of many saints. The upper niche contained a statue of Saint Louis IX, King of France. In 1827, the octagonal wooden dome and cupola were added. Life at the mission flourished until secularization came in 1833, when it was reluctantly turned over to the Mexican government after they gained their independence from Spain in 1821. This was a hard time for all at the mission. Many returned to Spain, including Father Antonio Peri, rather than endure the dismantling of church authority in the mission territories. In 1832, Father Peri boarded a ship in San Diego, headed for Mexico and eventually home to Spain. Upon hearing the news, many neophytes raced to the shore in an attempt to stop him from departing. The Mexican period of secularization brought with it frequent changes in governorship in Alta California, which led to a period of confusion and sporadic violence. The Luisenos had a difficult time. Many were not allowed to assimilate into the general population, and the lands that were once theirs had now been seized by the new immigrants. Buried in the church, our Father Salvidea, and in 1846, Father Ivarra, the last Franciscan friar to serve the mission, who bore witness to its decline and the ill treatment of the Indians. The original cemetery contained hundreds of burials, and a large monument was erected by Father Peri in memorial to all the Luiseño Indians who died and were buried there. Placement of the cemetery on the eastern side of the church has symbolism that relates to the resurrection and the rising sun. Prior to 1846, Bio Pico transferred much of the mission land to public ownership. Land grants distributed property to wealthy ranchers, soldiers, and other politically connected families that had migrated to the area. Much of the mission property, once thriving and bustling with activity, 
fell into disrepair and were all left to ruin. Alta California had become a prosperous territory with great potential and undiscovered resources which brought the U.S. and Mexico into armed conflict. In 1846, the United States Army first arrived at Mission San Luis Rey, taking up official residence in January 1847. By this time, the mission was completely abandoned and rapidly deteriorating. The military watched as local ranchers carted away whatever building supplies they wanted. This only added to the rapid decline of the mission structure. General Cook and the Mormon Battalion temporarily occupied the site through April of 1847, cleaning and making repairs to the quadrangle. Military troops occupied the mission from 1847 to 1849, and again in 1850 to 1852. In 1853, our Bishop Joseph Alameni submitted a claim to the federal government that the mission lands belonged to the Indians and the mission buildings belong to the church. On March 18, 1865, President Abraham Lincoln would sign a document returning the San Luis Rey property back to the Catholic Church. Decades passed before the mission had any new occupants. The development of the ranchos had their roots in the village sites that were first established and occupied by the indigenous Indian tribes of the region. Most of Camp Pendleton was a mission rancho as was Temecula, Bonsal, Fallbrook, Vista, San Marcos, Oceanside, and Carlsbad. A land grant of 1840, under the name of Los Vallecitos de San Marcos, transferred ownership of land once designated as a grazing rancho of San Luis Rey to José María Alvarado, an early Spanish soldier. It contained a sacred mountain where the All Spirit brought the first Indians from the east and taught them the spirit of the land, water, animals, and trees, and songs of love, battle, and death. Alvarado was killed at Palma Rancho shortly after the Battle of San Pascual in 1846. To date, the rancho is entirely subdivided and includes man-made Lake San Marcos. Rancho Buena Vista was given to a neophyte Indian at San Luis Rey, Felipe Subria, who held it for a few short years. Ownership transferred through several hands and eventually to Cave Johnson Coots, Sr., an American army officer. Soon after, Guajome Rancho, first granted to two Luisenos, Andres and Jose Manuel, fell into the hands of Abel Stearns and was then melded into the holdings of Cave Coots with his marriage to Isidora Bandini of Old Town San Diego. Over 13,300 acres of Rancho Agua Hedionda y Los Manos, now Carlsbad, was granted to Juan Maria Marron in 1841. Since that time, it has developed into a prosperous little city of commercial flower fields, suburban homes, car dealers, industrial parks, and destination beaches. One of the largest ranchos was Santa Margarita y Las Flores Rancho. From the Pacific at Ocean side, the land spread for miles into Orange and Riverside counties. The 89,700 acres of San Onofre y Santa Margarita was first granted to brothers Andres and Pio Pico. Combined with the acreage of Las Flores, obtained from the Indians in 1844, it created a sprawling 133,440-acre ranch. So to Juan Forster, it eventually grew to 226,000 acres. One of the great six ranchos of Mission San Luis Rey, it was dedicated to Camp Pendleton in 1942. Located a few miles east of the Asistencia de Pala, which was established in 1810, was Palma Rancho, located at the base of Palomar Mountain, where there was plenty of wild game, acorns, and abundant water. The murders of 11 Californians by Indian raiders following the Battle of San Pascual and the reprisal killings, attributed to the harsh treatment and displacement of the Indians which shadows the memories of the rancho. The tracts of Ranchos Temecula, Cuca, and Palma were granted and sold off rather quickly as the area boomed. Rancho Valle de San Jose and Rancho San Jose del Valle, later known as Warner Rancho, made up the most northeasterly grants within San Diego County. Unkept promises to the natives created strife, 
and natural and man-made disasters dashed the hope of settlers and investors as the routes of commerce moved west to the Pacific coast. In the vacuum, Arizona cattleman Walter L. Vale patched together these properties and a portion of Warner Hot Springs into the 85,500-acre Vale Ranches or Temecula Ranchers. Rancho Montserrat, granted to Isidro Maria Alvarado, now Fallbrook and Bonsall, was located on the route from Vista to Temecula, where the Butterfield Stage Road linked Yuma to Los Angeles. The Rancho period was fraught with stories of mistreatment, deceit, land grant, and claims, evictions, marriages, conflicts, and curses. Over the years, ranchos, for the most part, have been divided up into smaller and smaller parcels, city boundaries, and subdivisions. In 1892, the bishop offered the mission property to a group of Mexican Franciscan seminarians from Zacatecas seeking refuge from persecution in Mexico. A priest was provided for the local English-speaking community. Father Joseph Jeremiah's O'Keefe became the guardian and is referred to as the rebuilder of the mission. When he arrived, only the church remained of the once magnificent structure. Here he stands in the dilapidated ruins of the chapel. From 1892 to 1900, Father O'Keefe focused on repairs of the church. After a year of tedious work, the church was sufficiently restored. On May 12, 1893, Bishop Mora held a rededication mass. Although mostly in ruins, the foundations for the quadrangle could still be recognized. Reconstruction work began in 1903 on the smaller inner quadrangle of permanent living quarters on the foundations of the old mission where the museum sits today. About this time, many of the friars began to return home to Mexico. The rebuilding of the inner quadrangle and the church was completed in part using materials salvaged from the original buildings. In 1912, Father O'Keefe, after 19 years of overseeing the major reconstruction of the mission, retired to Santa Barbara. Restoration has continued throughout the years since that time. In the mid-1920s, the newly established Franciscan province of Santa Barbara moved their novitiate to this new quadrangle. As reported in the Oceanside Blade on July 29, 1926, Mission Tower is damaged. Corner of the Campanile at San Luis Rey falls to ground with a crash. With a crash that could be heard for a considerable distance and just as the big bell gave the call for early mass this morning, the entire southeast corner of the Campanile or bell tower at the San Luis Rey Mission fell to the ground. The portion of the tower that is wrecked is comparatively new work that was laid when the tower was repaired about 1897. The original portion built by the Padres in the early days, standing unshaken. By the 31st of March, 1927, the rebuilding of the tower is nearing completion. The two feet thick supporting pillars of steel reinforced concrete are in place beneath the belfry on all three sides. With an outside wall of concrete six inches thick, the mission belfry will appear exactly the same as it did before the collapse. The public fascination with the history of the mission continued to grow in the 1930s with the filming of the Vigilantes and continued through the 1940s and 50s. Disney Company's filming of four episodes of the TV series Zorro at San Luis Rey brought new audiences to the mission. Fiesta celebrations bridged cultures and united the various ethnic customs together in one place, San Luis Rey. For decades since, the mission has remained the hub of the greater Oceanside community. The parish of San Luis Rey developed over the years at the mission. In 1940, the Sisters of the Precious Blood began a boarding school on the east side of the cemetery. It closed in 1970, and the parish, having outgrown the old mission, leased the boarding school property and moved to this site. These former buildings now serve as part of the active parish of San Luis Rey. During mid-century excavations of the Lavanderia area, Friars rediscovered historical features 
buried under the layers of dirt and sediment accumulated over the years. The soldier barracks were also uncovered along with the bathing pools, lime brick kiln, and evidence of other industrial uses. Various artifacts were discovered and placed within the Mission Museum. In 1949, rebuilding of the large quadrangle began with new structures to house the institution called San Luis Rey College. Every attempt was made to preserve the integrity of the former buildings. Even the original colonnade arches that were still standing were preserved. Established to prepare Franciscan friars for solemn profession and the call to ordination within the Order of Friars Minor, the buildings, completed in 1950, housed the college until it closed in 1969. It serves today as a retreat and conference center, which continues to offer spiritual retreats and community services. In 1970, the Mission San Luis Rey Church was designated as a National Historic Landmark. Despite the fact that the mission does not receive support from the state, federal government, or the Diocese of San Diego, and relies on charitable donations, retreats and admissions, Restoration's efforts undertaken to stabilize and preserve the exterior of the church building were completed in 1984. It is still a living remains of an incredible episode in recorded world history. Travelers from around the world recognize this as a place of heritage worthy of preservation and descend on the mission to see it firsthand. The orchards of pears, apricots, peaches, and figs of Vista, Bonzel, and avocados of Fallbrook, Oceanside, and Carlsbad Citrus, grapes, and greens throughout the state, like so many agricultural products, find their origins in the orchards and gardens of the Franciscan friars. The California agricultural juggernaut of today can trace its roots to the mission era, the time of friars Junipero Serra and Fermín Francisco de la Suen. The pleasure and bounty of the seaside destination and fertile San Luis Rey Valley have nurtured and sustained its inhabitants for generations. The convergence of the two cultures more than two centuries ago set the stage for a community diverse as any other. It is important to recognize that the native inhabitants and the Spanish that interacted for such a brief time in history have powerfully shaped the complexion and character of our communities. At the core is a historic site populated with the material culture of this significant and challenging time. The ranchos of Santa Margarita y Las Flores, Los Vallecitos de San Marcos, Buena Vista, Guajome, Aguajedionda, once a part of the Mission San Luis Rey, are the towns of Temecula, Fallbrook, Bonzel, Vista, San Marcos, Carlsbad, and Oceanside. Luiseño descendants remain connected to the community and share a common heritage with later settlers. Built from the earth, expanded during the Mission era, and made relevant through common grounds and community involvement. In recent years, a tremendous amount of development has entered the San Luis Rey Valley. A highway was brought in and forever changed the area. Shopping malls replaced farmlands. A core historical area of San Luis Rey was developed surrounding the mission to recognize its heritage and to preserve the character of the community. While the goods of commerce take on unique appearances and the major routes of travel have shifted from El Camino Real, Inhabitants still occupy the land much as they have for centuries. Hunters, gatherers, or convenience shoppers, we all seek sustenance from an array of sources by fair exchange convergence as a community cultivated from the time of the missions, learning new skills in order to become good and productive citizens. From the first church of Pole and Thule to this magnificent structure of adobe, fire, clay, bricks, and wooden timbers still standing today, the mission continues to serve area residents as it did over 200 years ago. As emigres from a rich past of cultural experiences over great expanses and throughout time, we continue to migrate and converge at different places as humankind has since the beginning, replacing ourselves one for another for the continuum. Understanding our links to the past and our shared heritage informs our vision of the future.